once or twice in my lifetime. And then they were gone. That okay, well, me... let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, I, I think the main piece is that I, I wanted to apologize for uh, not being able to push through and get the white paper um, released before KubeCon. That had been my aspiration, but um, there are just too many things happening uh, as the conference got close. And so I am interested now in trying to drive it toward consensus and um, getting the initial chapters published and uh, then coming up with a plan on what the next couple chapters we're going to work on um, will be. Uh, there unfortunately are still a bunch of um, holes or open issues that we're going to need to uh, discuss uh, in order to get there. As of right now, I, I'm not sure that it actually makes sense to um, announce it or to publish it prior to Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. I think that's probably um, the best bet in terms of um, getting more awareness for it. And the advantage of putting it off a little bit is that after we do get a basically polished draft, I would um, like to run it by uh, both SIG app delivery, which is a new CNCF SIG and the Technical Oversight Committee. Uh, I'm not looking for the sort of formal approval of e e either of those bodies, but I do think it would be worthwhile to let them have a look. And uh, if it's not already on your calendar, um, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona is on February 24th. So um, I, my agenda for the day is I, I am interested in talking through um, a couple issues of the white paper if we have time. But uh, I was hoping that first uh, Taylor and his team could give us an update on the CNF testbed and what's changed recently uh, on it, what the plans are for the next couple months. And then um, I did want to have a short conversation uh, that I, I believe I pasted into the tug chat around the question of uh, Tosca and heat templates. And I would love to hear from both the uh, operators and the uh, vendors on the phone and understand as you're planning with CNFs, um, are you planning to use either Tosca or heat? Um, this is coming up in particular in the context of CNTT and, um, sorry to use all the acronyms, but um, the Linux Foundation Networking Project has the OPNFV subproject and they're launching the OVP, which is their verification process. They I believe they've already launched it for VNFs. They're beginning to talk about how to do it for um, CNFs. And I, I would like to um, understand people's perspective. I, I'll go ahead and, and throw out there, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. M my understanding of Heat and, and, and uh, Tosca templates is that they're, they're trying to specify at the wrong level around things like IP addresses and, and, and much more fundamental pieces of computing. Um, but if they don't, then it, it does raise the question of what kind of constraints are we expecting to put on CNFs? Um, for example, in terms of them being proper Helm templates or uh, their other kinds of usage of the platform. But uh, before we get to that question, which I am really interested in, I would love to go ahead and hand it off to Taylor uh, if uh, you and your team would, would like to give a CNF test, test bed update first. Sure, thanks, Dan. Um, so, a lot of, I guess, what's uh, been occurring in the CNF test bed is uh, tied into work moving towards KubeCon and some of the stuff there. So, um, from ONS, the last ONS, one of the main things that we were focusing on was trying to make it where the CNF testbed could be used by more people as kind of a dev area for the purpose of testing the different technology and ideas. And we did a tutorial at the ONS and got feedback and have been trying to roll a lot of that in and make it easier to um, reproduce everything uh, by others, any of the missing pieces and documentation um, any of the areas where 
maybe things don't work as expected and are harder to troubleshoot. Um, one of the specific areas that's um, been switching over on that was splitting the hardware provisioning from the workload or the workload platform provisioning. So that would be setting up Kubernetes, adding any the add-ons, uh, whether that's network service mesh or um, the Intel um, different um, Intel device plugins and and if it's Multis, any of these pieces that you're going to add, and then splitting that part out. Um, some of the hardware provisioning has to do with network provisioning. At Packet, we're able to provision the the actual VLANs and other pieces. So having those as independent parts. So the hardware provisioning piece is now separated and we're, we've been focused on breaking down the platform provisioning. So we have some more uh, examples and use cases that have, have gone into place, um, including the example that we went over for at KubeCon. Uh, we had some examples for using the Intel device plugin, both on the platform level and uh, some examples there. We've ex added, there's a Multis um, SRV example use case that's now in the test bed and continuing to build from that with some of the other use cases where we had one for the benchmarking that we've ported over um, to the new, the new structure and using more in-band items, so using more Kubernetes-specific pieces versus um, a lot of the Ansible code. So as we're doing those, we're able to use the new structure as um, components or examples that can be used in more complex use cases. So on the roadmap, I guess from here is more of the smaller pieces that we can build as well as looking at some stuff like uh, we would like to have Dan M added and did a lot of um, specking out before KubeCon. So that's on the agenda to get in place um, um, soon. And we are looking at maybe adding a broadband service orchestration use case based on um, some examples and information that we gathered from folks um, over the last couple of months. Need to get a little bit more details on that. And there's potentially a, a network function available for that that uh, we had talked about at ONS. And I think one of the bigger ones would be for Mobile World Congress. We're looking at putting together a 5G use case um, that also uses network service mesh and making that available. So talking with uh, various folks to put that together. I think that kind of covers the highlights on there and hopefully addresses some of the questions I've seen in the tag, like uh, re regarding uh, NUMA, NUMA zone awareness and topology and other stuff. We, we are planning on doing these things. In fact, uh, I think one of them would be the topology manager from Intel. We're going to be looking at um, adding those in as, as some of the components that could be used in more use cases. Michael, um, I think, uh, Pedersen, I think you're on the call. Do you have anything to add? Or call out specifically? No, I think you actually covered it quite well. Um, again, as, as, as you mentioned, we have some ongoing discussion on the talk channel as well. And, and I think, I think we're, we're getting to a place now where we have a, a good foundation for the test bed and that, that allows us to scale it out with some more complex both use cases and functionality. And I think the, the topology manager and, and the NUMA awareness, the node feature discovery and the, the CPU manager and, and the, uh, denim and whatever whatever plugins and tools we can we can find that could could make life easier when it comes to setting up these these CNFs and and environments. It's definitely something that we'll have to to look into and and add 
um, and if anyone has any ideas or any any tools that they think could be a good fit for the test bed, um, please let us know. One of the items that was um, been discussed recently on the tag channel was smart necks and FPGAs, and it's definitely something that we're open to exploring. I I think some of the questions were on how do you how would you implement these and still and do it in a cloud native way? And I think that's something that definitely needs to be explored. Um, some of the items would be what smart next could we look at? And ideally, what are going to be the most easily um, available for us to get? And then if anyone has any feedback on that and would like to. I, I have a caution on this okay. too, Taylor. Um, yeah. We should pick a use case before we just randomly do smart nicks. Um, it's something that I've learned through Dry by Fire, uh, but just doing smart nicks for the sake of smart nicks doesn't really show you a whole lot that typical SRRV wouldn't. So, coming up with some type of unique use case like TLS offload or I don't know, putting your virtual switch on the NIC and then doing um, header and cap decap there, but we should actually pick something that we want to solve and then see how smart NICs perform compared to doing it directly in the via CNF with um, SROV or something. Cause I hear a lot of random stuff about smart NICs from both vendors and inside my own company. And um, there's usually very little data or comparison to, you know, give you a strong justification for adding that use case specificity into your um, architecture. So, it'd be cool to actually figure out like what we want to test and then compare it, you know, apples to oranges directly to like a straight SROV or a straight VPP or something like that. That sounds great. So I, I know that you posted about the TLS offload. If, if someone has a, a specific use case they'd like to see, um, we'd start there. I, I think probably going along with that, Jeffrey would be, a spec um, in the CNF test bed. We have a project board that's specifically for this sort of thing. So if folks want to work on that, a use case um, that shows off where smart necks are going to be valuable, then um, we could start there and come up with something. And if it looks good, then we can start looking at implementation. All right. Um, okay. I think. So, yeah, I'll take over again. Um, since yeah. if I could start with the operators on the call, um, particularly uh, Jeffrey. Uh, and Jeffrey, if you could add yourself to the uh, if, everybody, if you could please add yourself um, to the meeting notes. Um, I'd love to hear um, your current thinking about heat and Tosca. Um, in uh, CNFs that you're that you I guess you have in your proof of concept today, and I see we also have uh, Rob Fisher on the call uh, from Verizon and and um, a couple folks from Sprint, um, and then uh, Herbert from Deutsche Telekom. I I'd love to get uh, any feedback from you on uh, on your thinking on that front. Like you mean using like heat stacks or you know using Tosca to define what I want to deploy in Kubernetes? Yes, exactly. Uh, the, the the context for the question is that um, the LF networking is it has an OVP certification program that they're using for C, uh, VNFs, and they're beginning to evaluate how to create a similar program for CNFs. But as of today. As I understand that program, and, and, and there might be somebody on the call, um, such as Phil Raub, um, who I'm happy to see back in uh, the LF world um, with a different hat on, who might be able to give a little bit more context on that. But my impression is that the main aspect of the certification is that they're um, running uh, Tosca and Heat SDKs to ensure that people's templates are compliant. 
um, which makes perfect sense to me for VNFs, but I, I don't actually understand how it would work for CNFs. Yeah, so my opinion is if you just want to use Tosca as a generic modeling language, um, I don't really care because there's a million different ways to convert Tosca to YAML and vice versa and to Yang and everything else. If you're talking about implementing a Mano stack above Kubernetes, then I would say I'm pretty against that. Um, one of my main motivations for looking into the cloud native approach and Kubernetes specifically is to break myself free of NFEOs and VNFMs where I can. Um, I, I don't necessarily, you know, have anything against them in the VNF space. Um, they're, you know, what all vendors support and kind of like where things are at, but um, just the whole concept of the way that configuration is passed down through the different, you know, souls one through five and things like that. Um, there's just lots of weird like dependencies, um, ill-defined APIs, which they are getting better, but they're not there all the way yet. So if I'm gonna take the time to, you know, move into the Kubernetes space and do all this in containers and deal with all the data plane challenges, I'd rather leave a lot of the orchestration baggage back in the VM space if possible. So Jeffrey, that's super helpful. And I, I will remind you that I'm still very hopeful you can get some of your internal documents cleared. Uh, you know, the, the charter specific stuff from it removed and, and publish those with the work group. But, um, could you just say a little bit more on if you do leave Mano behind, how are you envisioning that the uh, cloud native aspects, uh, uh, CNF architecture parts of your infrastructure are going to interoperate with the existing parts of it? Uh, in terms of provisioning, in terms of managing, uh, are, are you essentially uh, yeah, sort of. Can can you sort of talk through what are the pieces of Mano that you need to reinvent or or recreate? Um, sure. Let me. This is a <laughs> this is a very deep and complex um, thing that I have some emotional um, biases towards on certain things. Yeah, but, and if you could resolve it all in the next three minutes, we would. Yeah, uh, we would so I, I would just say the big thing is, is um, the concept of how things are abstracted between like, you know, individual VIMs versus individual VNF VIMs versus individual NFEOs, how sometimes they're packaged, sometimes they're not. Do I use element managers or don't I? Um, the packet core wants something completely different than what you know a virtual firewall wants. Um, as I start looking at virtualized CMTS, how do I run that in the same vim as I do with um, my you know my RAN things like that? And like the um, the Mano you know thing is very like pipelined, and I think a lot of assumptions were made when those block diagrams were originally made on like how configuration would be consumed, but like there's just all these weird restrictions, right? Like on, you know, what's defined in Sol 3 versus what's defined in Sol 5. Like how do I provision a network in OpenStack or VMware? Um, that, you know, if I talk to Nokia, I talk to Cisco and I talk to Juniper, they're all gonna have different opinions on that. And like whether or not like an individual tenant um, network goes with the VM and it's part of its life cycle so the VNFM manages it or it's part of the network um, orchestration element and it goes in the NFEO like there's all these like things that like are assumptions that nobody keeps the same that are present in the Mano space that like Kubernetes just kind of says I'm not going to put up with that like you you choose your CNI that's how I'm going to do networking if you want to do some networking outside of that with like NSM or something like that you know you bring your CREs and this and that and you you do your thing but like I, I just the whole the, the full life cycle of a VM and the Mano stack is very cumbersome and it doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room and it also like really forces a monolithic approach to how you deliver these services I don't think it fits well with like trying to decompose um, some of these more complicated network stacks into multiple microservices. So that's my Reader's Digest version. Yeah, that's great. So I uh, definitely looking for more feedback on this. I mean, I, I and I, and I need to figure out a more c c concise way of talking about what some of the things are leaving behind. Um, yeah. Would any of the other operators on the call um, 
care to to voice an opinion and and i i will be clear here that, that none of this is is when you sh share an opinion it's, it's not representing your organization it's not saying the official sprint or verizon or, or whatever opinion but if you could share some of your thinking and then I, i'd love to move on to the vendors as well yeah so how about Amka here so obviously heat will not uh, be a tool which you can use in the cloud native area because it's <laughs> It's an open stack service, yeah. So the equivalent for heat may be to say, okay, take the one which is the most natural one for uh, in cloud native ham shards or something like this. And um, regarding Tosca and all the Mano discussion, I'm not the expert, um, but. If I hear my colleagues from ONAP, they are also not uh, in favor of all this SE and we define stuff and see more that they need an end to end orchestration and a decent APIs for managing the domain of the, net, uh, of the network functions. So, target picture will look differently. So, it uh, will not be the mono stack. Um, yeah, and definitely not heat, but for the fraction of the people who prefer heat, I would guess that they will go with the tool which is uh, then selected or the best practice within the Kubernetes world. Yeah, I, I, I agree that heat is very tied to OpenStack and unlikely to be mm -hmm. broken free. I know that there have been efforts to look at what a Tosca for Kubernetes would look like, particularly uh, Tao Leron from Red Hat has made a couple pr uh, presentations at previous ONSs um, about the idea. And I, I think we could all agree that it is feasible to do that for some amount of work, you, you could implement it. But uh, the, the key thing that I'm trying to get at is, is there demand for it? Do folks feel like it's um, that level of modeling is essential uh, if we imagine a CNF such as a, uh, like the VBNG uh, virtual broadband network gateway as part of the virtual customer premises equipment, and you can package up those different uh, CNFs into Helm charts, um, do, uh, is there demand for an additional level of um, modeling or um, uh, component? management, um, tracking elements, et cetera, beyond what you're getting from the kind of uh, Kubernetes native um, aspects of the infrastructure. Um, can I call on other, uh, Her Herbert, feel free to say more, or uh, can mm -hmm. I call on uh, any of the other uh, operators no. on the call, maybe Todd or? I, I will take the, the question into one of the next com in conversations I have internally. Great, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd love feedback. It, it's definitely, I, I, I hope it was clear. I was joking about the answer in three minutes before. It's definitely an, an ongoing topic, but it, it, it is particularly relevant as we begin to look with our, our partners at LF Networking, what CNF certification might look like. Um, mm -hmm. what, what are the things that we would even want to test for in order to demonstrate mm -hmm. some level of conformance and interoperability? Yeah, what we definitely need is the definition how platform and not only Kubernetes, but maybe also the network plugins and some other tooling around, which will be used for CNFs looks like and that we get there an agreement across operators otherwise uh, it will every operator will have a different platform again and it's integration effort for the dnf vendors oh so, I, I totally agree that that part is is essential and so being able to say i mean if if it's just saying oh my cnf is completely conformant but only runs on this specific hardware uh and this specific uh version of Kubernetes all also from my company, then we, we've just taken a huge step backwards from uh, even from the VNF world. Um, and, and this is something we've heard very clearly from from other operators as well, that they are not not interested in taking that step backwards. And so a, a part of this is trying to define using things like device plugin 
uh, API to say, okay, if it requires a certain kind of smart NIC um, or a, a CNI plugin with a certain level of functionality, how can those kinds of things be specified in a in a general generic way so that any um, CNF architecture, CNF platform um, with sufficient capabilities will be able to signal that and um, and meet those needs. Mm, that's in both directions. Yeah. So a CNF should not require specific hardware because it cannot expect that the operator had just rolled out. So if they are comparable different uh, vendors for the same hardware type and the abstract and there should be some kind of abstraction so that the VNF vendor has not to bring a specific driver for the hardware into the CNF. Hey. Yeah, you know, Herbert, may, this might be a moment to just take a quick detour for a second. I, I was hoping somebody on the call could fill me in on this conversation that's happening on CNTT um, about SRIOV. Because my my understanding of it is that um, sort of the, the, the natural way within a, a CNF architecture would be to um, and Taylor, uh, feel free to speak up here if you're up to speed on it. Um, can you remind me how we're doing SRI IOV on the CNF test bed today? Who um, you are on, the CNF, on the CNF test bed, we're uh, trying to, I guess, keep things open. So we are using the um, Intel's, one of the, I guess, examples that we're showing right now uses the Intel device plugin. So that's the Kubernetes um, add-on for accessing. And then there's an, um, some other tooling and packaging for using SRV. So we're trying to keep that, I guess, as, as much as possible Kubernetes inbound. There are some pieces on packet where we have to make sure we have access at the host level. And are we using down. device plugin? to have yeah, the server advertise that it has that resource and then to have a pod claim the the resource? Um, yeah, that's that was recently added with, um, we have the device plugin and then I guess as far as advertising, there's different levels of that, that the, the tooling and pieces provide. So we have one example that's a very minimal um, what we're planning to do is extend that and show the way that, say, network service mesh can take the information from uh, the device plugin to other parts and then make that available as a service. And then there are other projects which would do something similar. Mm. Great. So it would definitely be nice to try and write up the plans on that. Is there yeah. anyone from who's active in the CNTT group and who followed yeah. that? Um, Issue, again, speak to it. again, have it. So we have a lot of discussions there. And so the core group of operators is quite aligned that we want to not prohibit SIOV as a mechanism because you need it uh, even with smart mix and all the stuff, but pass it through to the VNFs. So PCI pass through, we want to probe it because then it's not longer a cloud, yeah? then you're really binding the VNFs to the machine and they need to have specific drivers for this hardware. And if you introduce new, new hardware, they have to test with new drivers and all this stuff. So that is not what we want. Um, SIOV underneath and kind of abstraction with IO or here in Kubernetes, I don't know exactly which mechanisms we can use, but um so and in the infrastructure is okay yeah so that is not a problem but it should be not uh make the cnf hardware dependent that is our target there and we try to bring it in into the documents like this but there are also some uh some parties who are pushing back and say then it there will be no VNFs or CNFs which are compliant at all uh, because we need SIOE. 
the discussion is ongoing, but we want to bring it into the direction that we can have a more cloud. Yeah, have a cloud and not a virtualization. Okay, so could I um, ask some of the other operators on the call? Uh, maybe Todd and, from Comcast. And by the way, these discussions are all open on GitHub, so all visible. If you look for the right issues, you find the discussions. Great. Hey, Dan. yeah, I, I, I pasted in the link into the um, into the Zoom of the of the discussions. And, and I, I do want to compliment CNTT that it's fantastic to see uh, the, that open conversation on GitHub. Hey, Dan, can I ask a quick question too um, before the other operators Please. jump in? Is, is there any specific like technical um, deficiencies within Helm charts and config maps, which is pushing for Tosca? And is there any technical merits for why Tosca was chosen, you know, as opposed to like Yang or something like, are we only choosing Tosca because that's what was in the Mano stack and that's what people know? Or is there like some limitation in service chaining within the CNF space or something? I'm just kind of curious. Like what oh, I, I think it's exactly the right question. And, and I would emphasize to you that in no way have, have we chosen Tosca. Um, we, um, uh, we, um, I, I do I do agree with Herbert's point of why he is unlikely to to be correct. But no, I, I was sharing my understanding of where OVP is going, which is that they've, for understandable reasons, really focused on VNFs to start. They're now gearing up to look at CNFs. Um, that that work has not really progressed at all. But their natural approach is going to be to uh, use Tosca unless they. Um, go a different get, get encouraged to go a different direction and, and in terms of um, limitations on things like helm for service chaining and then you know things like prometheus for monitoring and such i, I mean I, I think the biggest one by far is just the operator's legacy systems and so having a story about okay obviously nobody is going to switch overnight from a vnf architecture to a cnf one um, the, these two platforms are going to need to coexist for years and years to come. Um, how can you manage the CNF uh, architecture and keep a uh, CNF platform and keep on top of uh, what you have deployed there and, and the progress and such and have that interoperate with some of your current systems? Um, and, but I, I, I would emphasize that even though that's a question, it's far from clear to me that, that requiring use of Tosca on Kubernetes is actually going to improve things. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, hey Dan, this is Melin. Uh, I, I completely agree uh, with the statement which you made, right? Like uh, exactly that's like the uh, challenges all the operators will have for coming years. And there will be like a heterogeneous workload in their environment. And and, 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 and so that's where, and, and that's the reason why what has been working for them like Tosca is something which they may, they have adopted along with when they were building their uh, NFB tooling, right? So they want to continue with that. And, but, but then the, there is another thing, right? Like uh, the capabilities of Helm uh, or like the other constructs which are already there in Kubernetes, they may not be fully aware of it. So there is this gap too, uh, which, which may uh, lead them to just fall back to what they know. Great. Um, so um, uh, Todd said that his audio isn't working, so we're gonna pass him. Could I go ahead and open up the question to, to everyone else? Um, I, I mean, particularly love to hear from uh, the vendors on the call. So um, Erickson, Cisco, Juniper, um, you obviously have sold existing management systems in that are working with OpenStack VNF platforms today. Um, as your customers start to use CNF architectures, CNF architectures, uh, in parallel next to it, what kind of management links are you going to need or phrased differently, are you going to offer, or are you going to sell uh, in order to uh, allow operators to have a view of what's going on in their network? All right, so this, this is Tomas from Ericsson, I think, then I, then I started off. I, I, first of all, I think this 
question goes deeper than just what the management system is or what management systems we would like to sell. Because I guess fundamentally as vendors, I would like to sell a management system that the operators would want to buy. Uh, I think this goes deeper in terms of what is the way of working that the operator is willing to accept with cloud native. Is, the, you know, is it okay to deliver individual services via CI/CD pipeline you know, that starts uh, with my development organization and ends with the customer? That's one extreme. And that model would probably not benefit from Tosca, most certainly wouldn't benefit from, from uh, Heat. Uh, or, or any other, you know, abstract uh, descriptor, that, that way of working would probably benefit from the most cloud native pieces of technology, like using the Kubernetes APIs and maybe having Helm somewhere. And, and I think that's where many operators are in the CTO office. Uh, but that might not be where many operators are when it comes to reality and operations and ways of working and operational model and the whole thing around that. So I think why this question comes up again and again is because the operators have something, they have invested into something and, and they would like to see a return of investment on, on, on that. So if, if that's something requires or uses Tosca as of today, then it's quite likely that we would have to support that with, with, with CNFs. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I think we discussed heat, so I don't think heat is a, a very good choice either way, but uh, I, I think when it comes to the artifacts to be delivered, I think that cannot be viewed as something independent from the way of working and the operations model the operators would like want to have with, with cloud native. And I know that from my perspective, if I would go to every customer like, hey, uh, here's my product, and by the way, you have to change your complete operational model in order to be able to use it, I might not be the chosen vendor for that use case. So long story short, I think we need both models, and then the challenge is to figure out what's the most cloud native way of delivering and most cloud native artifacts that we can transfer to an operator environment. And, that, and, and then what is the sort of the legacy or the uh, way that we use to be friendly with whatever the operators have invested already into. Okay, great. Can we get some other viewpoints, please? So I see we have Bill Mulgan from Lucy. I'm curious if you're seeing uh, CNF deployments at all among your customers. I think we're seeing uh, our customers just experiment, starting to experiment um, with CNFs. Um, I think the way that we're seeing it um, kind of in the future is kind of aligned with uh, the way you see it, Dan, where Kubernetes is kind of like the underlying, uh, let's say, orchestrator and that orchestrates both uh, VMs and containers. And so basically providing one platform to manage um, both legacy VNFs and CNFs together. Uh, sorry, and, and how, how do you manage the legacy VNFs? So I think we're investing into like Qbert, so running VMs in a pod so that you can um, do that. And so the way that we're looking at it right now um, is kind of like two different ways. Um, so one is running uh, VMs uh, orchestrated by Kubernetes through like Qbert um, as kind of like independent VNFs. And then the other thing that we're doing is basically using Kubernetes um, and Qbert to set up basically uh, a bunch of VMs and then creating another Kubernetes cluster out of that. So kind of uh, two different ways of doing that. Great. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, I think you've probably seen my diagram. Um, I can't paste a picture into um, Zoom, but I'll paste it into the, the tug um, uh, Slack channel that um, about evolving from uh, VNFs to CNFs. And I, I remain a fan of um, 
Kubevert as being a, a potentially important transitionary technology. And I mean, I think we should be clear that transitions are, are likely to be around for, uh, you know, a decade or so. So this is not a sort of overnight kind of thing, uh, given the, the, the sprawling nature of, of, of many telco operators. Um, could we yeah. have... Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. And um, I think with the um, operators that we're working with right now, um, they're actually uh, kind of aligned with us and like what you're seeing too, using VMs to manage these legacy things. And it's gonna take a long time to get off them, but um, they kind of like see the same vision that you are of running um, VMs on Kubernetes through like Kubert. Uh, could I get some other viewpoints, please? Yeah, I'd be interested um, to know. This is Ramsey from VMware. Hi, Hello? please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so, um, this is actually a very interesting question, uh, trying to apply Tosca for everything. So, we've been looking at this carefully um, in one app, especially, and also uh, internally in VMware almost the last couple of years. Um, so the learnings is that uh, applying Tasca for everything is not the right approach. I mean, Tasca is right is probably rightfully the right modeling language, especially for network services where you want to be declarative. For example, in expressing SLO such as state latency, right? Uh, but then it's not right to just carry it forward to expressing resource orchestration, which is essentially Kubernetes, right? Um, you know, that's, I think, uh, I think that's sort of what I'm hearing from several people. And other key point I want to stress on the capabilities, right? Um, so for example, when you're doing the 5G transition, um, I mean, essentially the service based architecture is, you know, leveraging HTTP 2.0, uh, we want to really make sure that we can leverage capabilities of the service mesh, especially for the control plane network functions, right? Um, as an example, 5G UDM, right? So, um, so now if you're trying to model all this through task, I don't know where we are going with this. I mean, basically it's going to be a while, while, while to get all these things done. We're actually probably taking a step backward is, you know, my feeling. Hey, Dan. So yeah. Ron, I can kind of give you an example of like, so the legacy conversation is one that, you know, I beat the vendors up on a lot, right? Because I have all this VNF infrastructure out there, but I don't feel like, I think where things get lost is you don't have to model everything in Tosca. Um, I would prefer that the, the sole interfaces um, be a little more flexible. So I wouldn't have to write um, custom plugin southbound for my VNFM, but I don't understand this concept of like you have to do everything in Tosca versus you have a small field in your, you know, Mano architecture um, that if it's going to have to do something in containers via Kubernetes, you know, part of its service chain is it makes an API call to Kubernetes, but all of those, you know, all of that standalone configuration, the charts, everything is still maintaining that infrastructure and Kubernetes services, you know, the VNFM the same way that it would service anything else, right? Um, so we have a couple of, they're not data plane intensive, but we've deployed um, in production a couple of CNFs um, for like control plane -y type stuff that actually work directly with um, things in VMs. And this is kind of how we've approached it is in our upper layer models that's provisioning all of our virtual infrastructure. We also um, write in some hooks that then make requests to Kubernetes and, you know, you put a route where you need a route on an interface and your service chain is there and your containers and your VMs talk to each other. So I don't know why we would need to try to like granularly define every single aspect in a single, you know, or a suite of Tosca models. Yeah, I appreciate that, that thought. Can you talk about what on the Kubernetes side is receiving the API call? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, um, I got to talk in generic terms here. Um, we well, have, let me just echo, uh, someone earlier mentioned CICD, um, which, which are, I really do think is a, a key concept that if, if you're not constantly redeploying and in particular able to constantly redeploy uh, your entire architecture, meaning uh, both the, the, the Kubernetes platform itself and then 
all of the CNFs running on top of it, then um, you, you really don't have, I would say, a, a cloud native um, architecture. And so if, if the Tosca uh, definitions are locking you into a brittle enough infrastructure that they're preventing that, then you just have a huge mismatch right there. Right. And I would say the CICD aspect is probably the main motivation for going through all the pain of shifting and lifting, right, is um, changing to Thomas's point. Like, so I do work in the office of the CTO and, you know, relationships with ops can sometimes be contentious when I try to turn everything upside down on them. And like the whole concept of the cloud native thing and what I don't have in the Mano space is the ability for ops to give me direct feedback, to do pull requests against my internal repos. Um, and, you know, YAML is super easy for them. So if a manifest needs to change, if they need an updated version, like our ability to communicate and share resources is substantially easier in this model um, versus, you know, we have like a few really sharp guys on the um, ops side that can really dive into Tosca. So, um, you know, as far as your earlier question, um, what we're using Kubernetes for is mostly a lot of the standard stuff um, as far as like, you know, API abstraction for um, a lot of our end services, taking advantage of, um, you know, the different types of services. We do a lot with um, external load balancers and the ingress resource type um, to uh, basically provide a little extra oomph because the scale that we have hitting these API um, ingests are astronomical. And then we have um, like, you know, some basic like routing functionality from like a control plane aspect sitting in containers behind these API gateways um, and some stuff around like, um, you know, IP mapping, things like that. Like I said, I can't go into really deep detail on this because it's all charter proprietary stuff. But um, the long and short is though, um, there's certain things that just don't work well in a container right now. Even with a lot of the cool software defined storage options out there, like certain databases are super finicky, anything that wants state. And so, um, you know, we, we have a mano stack, we'll have a mano stack, like you said, for at least another, I mean, we're cable, so we'll have it for at least another 30 years, if we're being honest. <laughs> um, like, so, you but just like, made some of, the, some of the vendors on the call very happy. Yep. They'll well, be happy yeah. to provide you support for that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we rely on them, right? But I mean, I just, I don't like this idea of mutual exclusivity. Um, even in my brownfield environments, I am deploying things in containers and finding ways to weave it in. And I let Kubernetes do what Kubernetes is good at. And I let, you know, um, both VMware and OpenStack do what they're good at, you know, and that's how I rock and roll. Uh, great. Uh, anyone else like to chime in? Um, I'll just mention a ramp key. If you could um, please add your name and, and email to the um, uh, minutes, uh, we'd oh, appreciate um it. Is then, yeah, absolutely, did it, yeah. That yeah. was uh, driving so far, yeah, I just got back. Oh, I understand. And uh, Ildiko, I, I uh, reached out to you on the TUG white paper. I'd love to engage with you a little bit more on that diagram. Um, sure. I'll take a look, thanks. Sure. Sure, then. Um, and it, it probably moving to the CNCF Slack is going to be a better conversation because we can do threading there or more easily there on um, than on the Google Doc. Um, would good. anyone else like to dive in on this uh, this conversation of um, uh, because I, I think a sort of a good topic for next time would be if, if the answer is not going to be heat and Tosca, what would CNCF cert sorry CNF certification look like? Um, I think folks are familiar with CNCF's certified Kubernetes program that I manage and we've been um, pretty um, pretty thrilled with how that's come together. It's actually kind of exceeded all of our our aspirations for it. We just announced at KubeCon last week um, that we'll have, uh, that we now have a hundred, uh, over a hundred um, uh, certified Kubernetes implementations. I just uh, 
pasted in a link to it that's that provides some useful context. Uh, but interestingly, on the we'll call it sort of enterprise or cloud side, we've never done the other side of that certification. Um, so if you think of us like Android, we're certifying that the phones are compliant, but we've never sort of certified that the individual apps are compliant. Um, I, I will point out that that we do have a set of tools. So in <laughs> particular, um, some of you may have heard of uh, API Snoop, which is um, being developed uh, very actively right now, specifically in order to look in at the conformance tests and to validate what um, what uh, which of the Kubernetes APIs are being managed by um, which are being addressed are being touched by which conformance tests. And so uh, this is under very active development and, and there's a lot of work going on there. But one of the things that we could use API Snoop for is to um, evaluate Helm charts. So if you imagine a CNF or a, a group of CNFs that you package up in a Helm chart, you could install those and then run them. And you could look at every API call that is um, being made by it. And then you could validate that all of those API calls are say in the stable or the beta APIs and, and of what version Kubernetes you're depending on, uh, not an alpha and not any kind of private call. And that would be a way of showing that your, um, that your CNF is um, conforming to a specific version of the, the Kubernetes API. So um, I, mm -hmm. I want to bring um, this up and I, I'm going to be, you know, writing it up much more, but I, I, I'm, these are very right. early days. So I, I'm not convinced yet that there is the demand for um, implementing that. And it would really particularly need to be demand from uh, telco operators and from their vendors. And then that, that it is hitting the right level of functionality in terms okay. of uh, trying to find what conformance would look like. Then um, I've just uh, thought that we might have a misunderstanding here regarding the OVP program and where this Tosca and Heat is coming from. Mm -hmm. That was that was a question to operators: which of these has to be sorted from ONAP point of view, so that ONAP has to work with Heat or can work with Tosca. And the, the operator said it has to be supported both. Um, if we look on uh, CNF or VNF towards infrastructure, that is not the discussion there. Because uh, they, I, they I agree are... that there's a yeah that there might be a, a, a mismatch here, but I, I have spoken to Arpit and to uh, Heather Kirksey who run the OVP program. And yeah. when I asked them, okay, well, how is how is OVP going to work for CNFs? Their answer was, well, we haven't really figured it out yet, but it's likely to be similar to the VNF program. And so that's the, yeah, yeah, that's but, the question I'm trying to look at. But there are two different certifications. There's a certification against NFVI or then CNFVI or however you call it. Yeah. And <laughs> there is the certification that uh, that a VNF is ONAP compliant, and if it is op and ONAP has to be su support both. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm interested so if in the, first one, it, the, the NFVI side of it. Yeah, then it's maybe uh, at, not the question at all. If we add now ham shards, then it's a challenge for ONAP because then uh, ONAP has to additionally support ham shards. Yeah? Yes. Which, which I, I mean, I, I think is something to look at going forward. But um, yeah. I think we should stop there. Just I, I would clarification. Love to have you, yeah. yeah, engage on the Tug Slack channel if you want to provide some additional context or links. Um, I, I, I'm just beginning to, to try and come up to speed on this certification question. And, and that mm -hmm. was really the purpose of the call today was, was to talk about some of those things at a high okay. level. Perfect. Okay, well, we, uh, let's stop on time. Thanks everybody for uh, the call today and I will see you on the uh, uh, Slack channel and uh, in a month. Bye now. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Cheers. Thank you all, bye.
Sehr.